join us and, and give us a talk on the topic of uh, change laboratories for expensive learning and uh, transformative agency. If your area or you're doing research uh, using activity theory, you must have heard your Angestrom's name. So give time for his talk. Thank you. Thank you. I see that it's exactly eight o'clock, so we can start. I mean, eight o'clock here, <laughs> at five o'clock for you. Um, thanks for inviting me. And obviously, uh, this is a very diverse uh, summer school, and you have had, uh, and you will have a chance to uh, see and hear and, and discuss many angles on cultural historical research and cultural historical activity theory. And my angle is just one, uh, often associated with uh, what, what some people call a Finnish uh, school of, of activity theory. And uh, I will particularly speak about the interventionist approach of this uh, uh, school, if you want. I personally don't think that there is any school, but there is a lot of people around the world who are using some of these instruments that we have developed and are trying to further develop and, 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 and apply. So I will now start sharing the, the slides, just a second. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> and uh, I'll, as a background, uh, a little bit about specifically educational research. Uh, although I have to emphasize that, as and I'm sure you are well aware of it, uh, activity theory is not specifically an educational research approach, and the uh, intervention method called change laboratory is not uh, limited to education. However, much of the debates that are relevant uh, for this, uh, for the understanding of this method can be uh, traced specifically in educational research. Uh, in educational research, there, there has been a, a very strong um, orientation toward randomized controlled trials uh, as the so-called gold standard uh, of, of research. Uh, and this um, striving for uh, very rigorous uh, types of uh, large statistical samples with control groups uh, and, uh, um, and the, all the, all the uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, uh, this is uh, quite as tightly intertwined with um, policies and uh, and uh, uh, management styles, which uh, are very much um, uh, dictating the 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 practices and policies from above. Uh, this uh, tendency is mostly uh, observable in the United States. Uh, but not only. Unfortunately, it has spread uh, uh, quite a lot around the world, and and uh, uh, there is a there is a tendency when people speak about um, evidence based policies or evidence based decisions to consider evidence um, valid evidence only as uh, based on this type of um, research. But there is also increasing dissatisfaction with the, this mode of research, uh, stemming largely from the fact that this type of research tends to confirm the existing rather than uh, open up possibilities for something new. And uh, uh, that's why uh, there's, there are increasing um, uh, signs of, of uh, questioning this type of research and uh, and 
uh, seeking for alternatives, which, which uh, aim at finding more relevance and more practical impact for research. And uh, I think that it's particularly encouraging to see that um, this type of uh, efforts are often based on sort of bottom up uh, uh, practices, uh, building coalitions and partnerships between researchers, uh, educational practitioners, and also communities uh, in which education happens. So this is kind of the background. There is a continuing struggle and obviously, uh, the types of interventions that I'm talking about, they are not the majority or mainstream. They are uh, something like um, um, a deviation or alternative. At the same time, I think the, the fact that uh, particularly in the global South, we see um, a very um, powerful uh, movement toward this type of interventionist uh, methods or formative interventions, as I call them, is particularly uh, important. Uh, because in the global South, in, in, uh, in various countries, in various cultural settings, uh, the societal challenges and crises are so concrete and uh, inescapable that uh, researchers, uh, cannot afford to uh, stay as if in their ivory towers and, and uh, detached from those realities in the field. Anyway, um, there is a, uh, something of a history to the rise of intervention research, especially in education, but also more broadly in social sciences. One of the milestones is uh, uh, the emergence of what was called design-based research or design experiments. Uh, uh, this uh, was launched uh, in 1992, particularly by an important article uh, written by Anne Brown um, about uh, design experiments uh, in which uh, she and, and subsequently many others uh, argued that uh, in order to have research that has actual impact, for instance, in school settings. Uh, we need to create new designs which are then tested in practice iteratively so that they, uh, when, when in the practice a new design is, uh, is uh, working and you see some shortcomings or, or limitations in it, you can then uh, take a new iteration, improve it and, and make it better. And this requires that researchers collaborate with practitioners uh, and uh, uh, this type of experiments are not something where you uh, either confirm or disconfirm a, a, a singular hypothesis, but they are generative, that they generate new hypotheses and new ideas as they go along. Um, however, uh, as um, I and uh, some others have noticed uh, there are also limitations in this uh, approach or design-based research. Uh, largely, the idea was still that the designs were made by researchers, not by practitioners or users. In other words, the practitioners, and of course also students, the learners, were uh, positioned as um, those who implement the designs, but not those who actually generate the designs. And uh, this also this is intertwined with the with the lacking concern uh, with um, the agency of the practitioners and learners themselves. In other words, it still had this kind of linear and to some extent top down. Um, uh, thinking built in to it, although it's at the same time challenged the existing uh, positivist uh, paradigms of research. The idea of formative interventions, which is uh, the foundational idea of the change laboratories, um, is that uh, it stems from uh, uh, the Russian, the, the Soviet Russian uh, uh, 
work of uh, um, cultural historical activity theorists uh, who used uh, over the years uh, various different notions to describe this type of research. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, there's a very nice description of, of, of this um, in an early paper by Yuri Bromfenbrenner, I think it was uh, already 1977, after he had uh, met with uh, some of the uh, uh, Soviet colleagues, particularly with uh, Alexei Nikolaevich Leontiev. Uh, in, and, and Bromfenbrenner uh, describes that uh, these uh, Russian colleagues, they emphasized that instead of uh, analyzing what people are, it is more important to analyze what they can become. And uh, therefore, you need a different type of, of research approach. Uh, sometimes they were called uh, genetic experiments. Uh, uh, there are very many um, uh, names used, uh, but the basic idea was to try to find the potentials rather than only the current existing uh, state of, of affairs in, in human activities. <clears throat> now, the, the notion of formative interventions uh, uh, was put forward uh, to emphasize that there is this, um, let's say, open-ended, unfinished characteristic that we don't know ahead of time what is the end result of the intervention. The end result of the intervention is in the hands of those practitioners or participants or learners who are actually owners of the activity. Uh, and they design their own future. Um, now, in recent years, uh, Practically the last, the past uh, uh, roughly 10 years, uh, the formative interventions uh, have become much more um, widely discussed and widely known. Uh, I think a very useful source is the special issue of Journal of, of the Learning Sciences uh, from 2016, uh, which discusses the relationship between design based research and and activity theoretical formative interventions. And um, Jim Green, who unfortunately passed away recently, uh, um, a very important figure in the development of the learning sciences, um, uh, writes in that issue that the method of formative interventions can <clears throat> increase generative capabilities in groups of practitioners because formative interventions based on activity theory can and must generate a new type of dialogue and complementarity between practical impact and rigorous analysis. Analysis leading to understanding of this dialogue and complementarity and the development of generative capabilities that result would indeed provide a significant advance in the field's understanding of learning and development. Um, this type of recognition uh, should be seen as a starting point for um, increasing dialogue between various, uh, uh, let's say, approaches that share the interest in um, generative research that goes beyond the status quo. <clears throat> um, I have uh, presented a, a, a relatively simplified uh, comparison between what I call linear interventions and formative interventions. Uh, linear interventions uh, for me, uh, they are those intervention studies in which the researcher uh, has ahead of time decided what this outcome should be. And formative interventions are typically uh, those in which the starting point is a challenge, a problem, a contradiction, which requires transformation, but the end result of the transformation is not known ahead of time, but uh, actually shaped during the intervention. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this means that the researcher's role is also quite different in these two types of interventions. 
in uh, linear interventions, including design-based uh, research, the researcher's aim is to control uh, the variables and to control the situation. Uh, whereas in formative interventions, the researcher is more uh, in the position of provoking and, and supporting uh, a process of design that is not determined by the researcher. Now I come to the change laboratory as the uh, most uh, widely uh, used and widely known uh, example of formative interventions. The starting point is that there is an activity system or multiple interacting activity systems that face a challenging uh, uh, problem or crisis or transformation that they need to uh, deal with. In other words, you could say that the starting point in, in change laboratories is the need and the need is expressed in the form of a conflict or contradiction. Prior to uh, a change laboratory intervention, there's typically a fairly uh, extensive period of field work to to, uh, during which the researchers often also participants or the, or the intervention, the practitioners um, collect what we uh, colloquially call mirror data on the challenges uh, in the field, uh, how they are manifested in practice and experience. This means that there is a, a, the task is to find and identify and to record critical situations, critical um, uh, components or, or critical events in the activity in which the, the, this major challenge or contradiction is <clears throat> manifested and experienced. <clears throat> this is typically often done by means of videotaping, uh, uh, interviewing, uh, uh, field observations, uh, collection of various kinds of documents, etc. Uh, and this uh, mirror data is used to select uh, uh, critical samples that are used as prompts in the actual change laboratory sessions. In the sessions, which uh, typically are uh, something between six and 12 sessions, typically lasting a couple of hours, <clears throat> and um, uh, often they are relatively uh, frequent, uh, uh, once a week, once in, in, in every two weeks, but sometimes more spread out. Um, the, the, the starting point is that this mirror data or uh, samples of it are, are presented to trigger and, and make, uh, <clears throat> make available the, the conflict of motives uh, among the participants that is related to the contradiction in the activity and to start working on it uh, toward an expansive resolution. <clears throat> uh, the participants move forward to analyze the historical development and present contradictions in the act, their activity system or multiple activity systems, trying to identify root causes of the trouble. And this leads to uh, the next step when they uh, start to project a zone of proximal development for their activity, uh, typically looking for key dimensions of development and, and uh, to design a new model for the activity. The change laboratory uh, in an ideal case uh, will also follow up on the, uh, at least on the early phases of the implementation of the new model. Uh, often it, it is first tested in, in a sort of spearhead projects, which are like pilots uh, of the new, and then gradually um, uh, implemented in a more uh, systematic manner. <clears throat> the entire process is shaped to generate an expansive learning cycle uh, uh, with, 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 which has loops of double stimulation embedded in it. And I will come back to this uh, shortly. All the sessions are videotaped and, uh, for rigorous analysis and uh, 
Uh, indeed, uh, since the inception of these change laboratories uh, in 1995, they have been uh, conducted um, in more than 30 countries, and, and there is a large number of, of um, uh, referee publications on them, and I'll be happy to share uh, some of them if, if you're interested. You feel free to also contact me uh, separately if, if you need references. <clears throat> now, here are some er examples or images of early change laboratories. Uh, uh, the very first one was conducted in, in 1995 in, 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 uh, in the Finnish postal services with, with uh, postal workers. Uh, soon after that, uh, uh, there was a change laboratory in a middle school with the teachers. Uh, uh, then in the low, uh, at, at the lower part of this, this picture, you see also an image from a, a change laboratory in a hospital and a change laboratory even in a bank. Um, now, these are more, more recent examples. Uh, another hospital uh, uh, setting of, of home care services in the city of Helsinki, the University Library of the University of Helsinki. These are merely images from Finnish change laboratories. <clears throat> now, the, there is a kind of a uh, Simply, simplified. This is a simplified uh, image of the layout of the of the change laboratory space. Uh, the practitioners gather together, typically around a table uh, and um, uh, facing one another, if possible, and and also facing uh, the three surfaces. Uh, the one on the right uh, is called mirror, in which the the mirror data. Uh, uh, data about the, the troubles, difficulties, uh, challenging situations, uh, conflicts are shown. And the, the, the surface on the left, uh, called model and vision, uh, is, is where the conceptual tools of activity theory, for instance, models of the activity system are are presented, used, and, and, and uh, manipulated to analyze the, the uh, examples uh, presented in the mirror. And in the middle, there is a space uh, for emerging new ideas. And uh, um, the change laboratory practice is very much movement between and across these three surfaces, but not only um, uh, horizontally, but also in terms of moving in time, uh, looking at how the situation was in the past, how it is now, and how it could be in the future. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here you see, um, this is taken from a hospital uh, change laboratory session. These three surfaces can be very simply, uh, like in this case, they are just uh, simply flip charts. Uh, uh, and, uh, and there is a scribe working on them. And there is a person with a camera uh, uh, documenting everything. Much of the, of, the, of the videotaping also serves the further uh, movement of the change laboratory process. Uh, so we often, after each session, we look at the video uh, and um, select clips which represent issues that were left unresolved or uh, debates or important ideas that need to be returned to. And so those clips may be shown in the next session to provide for continuity and further elaboration. <clears throat> now, this uh, has been a relatively practical presentation of what a change laboratory may look like. Um, uh, now, a little bit more uh, about the methodological and epistemological background. Um, <clears throat> there are two key principles behind these formative interventions. The first one is the principle of ascending from the abstract to the concrete, which is manifested in the, in the construction of and, and, and uh, analysis of cycles of expansive learning. <clears throat> and 
Uh, the second one is the principle of double stimulation, which uh, aims at uh, generating transformative agency among the, the, the participants. Uh, the principle of ascending from the abstract to the concrete is a, is a core uh, principle of, of dialectics uh, and has a long history, at least back to Hegel and specifically to Marx. Uh, in activity theory, particularly, and first of all, the key philosopher who inspired many activity theorists, Eval Ilyenko, uh, uh, in his work um, elaborated on this principle a lot. And uh, Vasily Davidov, uh, uh, the key Russian um, educational psychologist, uh, uh, turned the principle of ascending from the abstract to the concrete to something very practical to guide the shaping of learning activity. <clears throat> um, the principle of double stimulation is, uh, comes directly from Vygotsky. Uh, Vygotsky wrote in, in, in multiple occasions about double stimulation. And um, it is basically the principle of how human will is formed. Um, uh, and um, th th therefore it's uh, in, in our current parlance, uh, we would talk about transformative agency because will for Vygotsky meant a human capacity to change the circumstances and change one's own life. <clears throat> now, I will uh, elaborate a little bit on both of these principles, uh, even at the risk of being a bit uh, overly theoretical. You can, you can then <laughs> perhaps uh, uh, pull this back back to the ground um, when we have a discussion. So ascending from the abstract to the concrete, from the point of your learning, it means that learning begins from anomalies and co or conflicts in the sensually experienced concrete, uh, but understood not as isolated things, but as the complex uh, 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 relationships, uh, uh, complex relations in which acting. Um, this initial concreteness, uh, uh, it appears to, to the subject in some particular fragmentary manifestation that is abstractly, as Ilyenko says. Now, empirical thinking merely reduces the sensually concrete into abstract one-sided definitions or categories, which leads to reproductive learning. And to go beyond that, we need to construct an abstraction that captures the origin of the phenomena under scrutiny. A prime example of such an abstraction is the idea of commodity as the germs of all capitalism developed by Marx in his capital. The <clears throat> idea of a germ cell uh, uh, is very, very important in uh, ascending from the abstract to the concrete. In other words, to put it very simply, uh, learning proceeds from the initial uh, fuzzy concreteness to, to identify a foundational relationship or foundational principle behind um, the, the, the concreteness and, and <clears throat> to rise to a new mastery and understanding of the concrete to ascend to the concrete with the help of this initial abstraction, um, which means that the concrete becomes uh, theoretically understood concreteness and it becomes something that can be expanded, extended, developed and, and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> becomes uh, in that sense something entirely new. It is not reproduction but uh, uh, creation of the new. The James abstraction is the starting point from which one ascends to the conceptually mastered concrete. It's the genetic basis from the development of which all other just as particular phenomena of the given concrete system may be understood in their necessity, as Ilyen Kovar writes. <clears throat> and now, the principle of ascending from the abstract to the concrete obviously requires that uh, learning is very much a process of investigating, analyzing, and then redesigning reality. In other words, it's uh, like I have said, it is learning something that is, that is not yet there. 
in other words, creating something new, a new practice, a new form of activity. <clears throat> That's why I, I call it expansive learning. <clears throat> so the principle of ascending from the absolute to the concrete is uh, the core uh, of, of uh, the theory of expansive learning. Expansive learning is, first of all, learning that is embedded in transformations in activity systems. It's learning driven by contradictions in the present activity. And we can understand it as a joint journey across a collective zone of proximal development of, of, of an activity or multiple activities. And it is learning what is not yet there, collab collaborative creation of new concepts and interactive patterns of activity. The created new object is radically wider in terms of uh, at least three dimensions. First of all, uh, socially and spatially, it involves uh, new uh, participants, new uh, spheres of impact, uh, Secondly, also temporarily, the duration and sustainability increase. And finally, sorry um, to return, finally also in terms of ethical and political responsibility. So the expansion is a multidimensional uh, phenomenon and at least these three dimensions should be kept in mind. And finally, expansive learning is also multi-voiced sideways learning in a sense that it is not just uh, learning uh, to, to um, reach something higher. It is perhaps more, most importantly, it is struggle negotiation and hybridization between alternative perspectives and positions. In that sense, uh, you could think about it as a horizontal more than vertical learning. So to sum up the expansive learning cycle, uh, it's, a, it's a process of resolving contradictions by means of learning actions that follow the logic of ascending from the abstract to the concrete. <clears throat> and I, this, this uh, schematic image that uh, is on the screen uh, tries to capture the key learning actions in a, in a cycle of expansive learning, <clears throat> starting from questioning and analysis and modeling, going all the way to um, uh, implementing uh, the new model, uh, reflecting on the process and consolidating and generalizing the new practice. <clears throat> this type of a, a sequence of learning actions uh, uh, is, easily misinterpreted as some sort of a rigid um, uh, scheme. Uh, it, it is meant to be a heuristic device. Hardly ever, perhaps never, you will see in reality that uh, this um, uh, order and, and nice neat sequence of learning actions occurs. Typically, it's much more iterative, um, often has breakdowns, uh, 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 has to uh, move backwards to, to gain new uh, uh, momentum, et cetera. So uh, cycles of expansive learning are, this is not the normative image that uh, uh, you, you seek, but it is more a heuristic device for actual concrete analysis. <clears throat> but of course, in interventions, the interventionist researcher aims at generating specific learning actions. It is also important to note that uh, there are multiple scales in expansive learning. You may think of, of uh, the biggest, biggest scale as historical transformations in, in the uh, entire uh, systems of, of uh, um, socioeconomic uh, formations, uh, 
uh, a mid medium range would be specific activities or activity constellations uh, going through major transformations and then there are uh, these smaller uh, embedded cycles or uh, you might, might call the mini or micro cycles uh, uh, in which specific innovative solutions in the activity are generated so it's important to to keep in mind that uh, that there are multiple scales uh, when you look at learning and uh, including expansive learning recently in recent studies uh, just a couple of years ago, we published an article in the Journal of the Learning Sciences looking at very short mini cycles in, in home care encounters where a new practice was, was implemented in, in, in home care services and the home care workers visited their, their elderly clients maybe half an hour at the time. And, and these encounters were analyzed in great detail to identify mini cycles <clears throat> At the same time, the entire home care practice was undergoing a, a macro cycle of transformation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm writing a, uh, an article together with the, with the doctoral uh, student of mine, uh, looking at um, a cycle that has lasted over a year uh, in which uh, a cooperative uh, of, of local um, uh, residents who uh, are trying to, uh, or actually are uh, producing their own um, uh, vegetables in a, in a, to, to uh, provide an alternative to the commercially produced, industrially produced food. Uh, and this uh, cooperative went through a transformation, uh, which we, my, my doctoral student followed for more than one year. Uh, uh, recording 27 key meetings which then are analyzed uh, so this is a very different scale from a half an hour when you're talking about uh, 13 months and 27 meetings uh, so <clears throat> expansive learning processes as i said are uh, come in multiple scales but uh, when you're uh, if you're thinking of a change laboratory uh, and and how to uh, uh, facilitate expansive learning expansive learning cycles in in a, in a change laboratory it's important to keep in mind that on one hand uh, it is uh, the researcher interventionist needs to try to understand what were the previous preceding cycles like uh, and where is the activity system in its current development in other words, the cycles are also used as a diagnostics, including historical diagnostics. Um, and then you need to design an expansive cycle that you want to accomplish with the change laboratory. Which learning actions do you want to, to, uh, to promote in the different phases of the intervention and how? And thirdly, you actually have to acknowledge that the, what happens is never what you planned. The actually accomplished expansive cycle is different from what you intended because it is not your cycle, it is the cycle of those learners. So which learning actions did the participants actually perform and how did their uh, actions differ from the ones you had planned? <clears throat> this deviation, this difference between your plan and the actual, actual implementation, actual uh, events is crucial because it is actually the gap that you need to study to understand how the um, agency of the learners emerges. So expansive learning in a change laboratory must be carefully planned. You should know which learning actions, uh, uh, which learning action is aimed at any given moment, but expansive learning never follows the plan. The participants and the dynamics of the activity systems take over deviations from the plan are most important because they are windows into the formation of transformative agency among the participants but the plan enables you to act at the same time it must be continuously challenged revised readjusted and questioned so <clears throat> now i will move um i wonder actually how i'm doing with the time you see i I just recently woke up. It's very early morning here in, in, in Finland, and I'm not necessarily very 
sociable or or alert to people's need at at the this time so okay i think i'm not yet exceeding the time so so we can proceed uh, please uh, when you have objections questions or comments or questions uh, just uh, try to write them down or remember <laughs> remember them so that we can return to them uh, i will just continue my monologue for another 10 minutes perhaps and then we can discuss so the second principle uh, behind the change laboratory is uh, double stimulation. Like I mentioned, this comes from Vygotsky. Vygotsky saw the human will, uh, the, the human capability to willfully transform one's conditions and one's own life as the most foundational quality of being human. And uh, will unfortunately it has been largely neglected in, in much of the studies uh, of uh, sort of Vygotskyan tradition. Will uh, uh, has not been a fashionable topic. And even the principle of double stimulation uh, was typically, has been typically interpreted as, as uh, just another name for mediation. So that uh, artifacts uh, help you to uh, achieve uh, cognitively or practically tasks that you couldn't do without uh, the, the help of uh, mediating artifacts. But for Vygotsky, double stimulation was primarily about will. <clears throat> How human beings can actually uh, influence their own lives. And <clears throat> for Vygotsky, the formation of will is intimately connected to a conflict of motives. Uh, Vygotsky is not the only one who has noticed this. Uh, there, uh, there are many other scholars who have noticed that the human will is really tested in a situation of conflict. Uh, for instance, Hannah Arendt uh, is one who, who has written about that and many others. But basically, we got what Vygotsky did he developed a, a fairly detailed account of how a conflict of motives lead to the formation of uh, will, willful action, uh, volitional action, or what we might call transformative agents. <clears throat> and this model here that you see on the screen is uh, developed by Annalisa Sannino in her uh, pioneering work on, on double stimulation, uh, a theory that is called TADS, uh, transformative, a transformative Agency by Double Stimulation. <clears throat> and, and perhaps the, the most helpful way to understand this is to, to think of the, the example that Vygotsky gave, as a, which is a classic example, that the so-called um, waiting experiment or the experiment of meaningless situation, which is, is an experiment that Vygotsky never conducted, but he learned about it from Kurt Levine and, uh, and um, Kurt Levine and, and um, uh, Tamara Dembo also didn't conduct this experiment to study will, they conducted it for another purpose. But when Levine talked about it with Vygotsky, Vygotsky transformed it in his mind into, into a key a way to understand and, and illust illustrate the principle of double stimulation. Uh, then um, Annalisa Sannino actually did these experiments uh, both with individual subjects and with small groups. Uh, and uh, the, the elaboration of the principle of double stimulation into a theory of TADS is, is based on this experimental work. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, let's use this example of the waiting experiment. Uh, the, the situation is simple. An experimenter has invited a subject to participate in an experiment, in a psychological experiment. The subject is brought to a room and the experimenter leaves uh, 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 asking the, the subject to wait. The subject waits, but the experimenter doesn't return. Nothing happens. And the subject grows uh, 
little bit nervous, starts to, you know, oscillate, what should I do? Nothing is happening. The, the experimenter is not returning. I have other things to do in my life to, than just wait here. But on the other hand, I promise to wait. So a conflict of motives is generated between, you know, the, the, uh, the fact that the, the subject promised to wait and, and participate in an experiment. And on the other hand, that the, 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 the subject wants to continue with his or her life and do other things. The simple conflict of motives is the first stimulus. And uh, this conflict situation. <clears throat> now, according to Vygotsky, what happens, and this is of course based on uh, Levine's uh, uh, description, uh, that many subjects, after a while, they uh, after a lot of oscillation and, and hesitation, they they, for instance, they look at the clock on the wall and decide that when the clock strikes two, I will leave. The clock in this case becomes the second stimulus that enhances your will by giving this artif uh, artifact, this uh, in itself a neutral artifact like the clock a specific meaning in this case, filling it with specific meaning. It becomes a critical sign that allows you to, as if, to pull out yourself out of the troublesome situation. It, it empowers you to, to make the decision. And when the, the um, clock actually strikes to, that is the uh, uh, critical moment, uh, if you can follow that uh, decision that you made, you actually walk out. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, this means that you have Im you're implementing the second stimulus. Uh, the, uh, Vygotsky dis distinguishes between the decision phase and the implementation phase, or he calls them uh, two apparatuses of will. <clears throat> and the implementation phase typically looks very automatic and smooth but it's the decision phase, which is troublesome. It may be that, you know, when the clock strikes two, that you don't have the guts or the courage to actually leave. You have to set a new second stimulus to, to try again. Uh, but basically <clears throat> you can think of this uh, as a basic human mechanism. And Vygotsky uses many examples, uh, 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 starting with the, if, if you need to wake up early in the morning and you know that uh, you're going to be sleepy, you don't want to wake up early in the morning, but you have to, what do you do? You invoke the second stimulus of the alarm clock. And what is interesting is oftentimes when we put the alarm clock like, okay, I need to wake up at six o'clock, you might actually wake up five minutes before with, even without the alarm, because you have actually created this uh, uh, second stimulus also inside you. It's already in you. <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, so the the but it's it's important that there is this artifactual material dimension uh, uh, of of the, of the second stimulus. It's it's a real artifactual uh, uh, instrument that helps you empowers your will, helps you as uh, like like Vygotsky said to control your yourself from the outside. <laughs> so. Uh, here's the dialectic, so inside and out, outside, because it's you, you're controlling yourself, but by means of external artifacts. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the relevance of, of the double stimulation in, in change laboratories is that if you think about the uh, cycle of expansive learning, practically in every step, you need to invoke the mechanism of double stimulation, because you, again and again, you face the conflict of motives. Think about any major change in your life or in your activity. It's conflictual. It's much more comfortable to let things be. It is demanding and often painful to start the change. So you're, you're, you're facing this uh, difficult conflict of motives again and again. And therefore, invoking uh, this me mechanism of double stimulation in the change laboratory is very important. Um, allowing and, and, and actually 
promoting the use of um, various artifacts as second stimuli. <clears throat> Often in change laboratories, those artifacts are, are key models or key concepts that the participants adopt as a kind of <laughs> uh, their um, empowerment. Uh, they can be symbolic uh, uh, images. They can be uh, also practical concrete artifacts. Uh, <clears throat> now, to move on, <clears throat> we might say that in, in a change laboratory, there are a number of key instruments, conceptual tools. Uh, and I have now uh, touched upon especially uh, three uh, only very briefly, and I cannot go into this instrumentality of the change laboratory much further, but uh, just point out that, first of all, the well-known triangular models of activity systems are typically used as uh, important artifacts, uh, important conceptual tools in the change laboratory. Seco uh, and they, they are uh, used to ask, what is the object of this activity? What are the key other activities involved with this object? Uh, what are the most acute, uh, acute uh, sore connections? Uh, 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 the, the, what are the contradictions within and between these systems? Then the, the cycle of expansive learning uh, answers questions, which cycle of expansive learning are the stakeholders fostering, if any? Uh, where are we now in this, in this cycle? What part does this change laboratory play in this? Uh, and, and finally, the third uh, instrument, which I have really only very briefly mentioned, is the, the notion of a zone of proximal development, a collective zone of proximal development. We typically, in change laboratories, use um, um, a four field models in which um, you identify uh, two historically critical dimensions of development. And you, you create a four field with the help of those to analyze different patterns of the activity that is uh, being developed and, and what will be the zone of proximal development <clears throat> of that activity. Unfortunately, um, like I said, I cannot go into the details of these instruments or other instruments in change laboratories, but uh, uh, certainly the, the readings and, and uh, and publications on this topic are available. And uh, for instance, in, there, there are some, a couple of recent, very interesting articles by, uh, by uh, Sharon Chang in the United States uh, was written on the use of the four field models, the, the, uh, the zone of proximal development uh, four fields in um, um, the training of, uh, of um, uh, uh, the teachers, uh, 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 bilingual teachers uh, in in the United States and <clears throat> and many other publications that might be useful if you become interested. Now uh, I'm coming toward the toward the end of this talk. Uh, a question is what kind of research knowledge does a change laboratory produce? And uh, uh, first of all, obviously. Uh, change laboratory interventions uh, uh, generate new solutions to local challenges. For example, solutions to overcoming fear and confrontation in the culture and working of a supported housing unit for formerly homeless youth. Now, this is a recent um, intervention conducted by Annalisa Sannino and her research group uh, to help uh, uh, people eradicate homelessness in Finland. <clears throat> um, uh, in other words, uh, there are new practices and new uh, models of activity that are developed for concrete local circumstances. Then new conceptualizations and modes of implementation of policies and principles which uh, go beyond the local. For example, in, in this case that I'm, I'm referring to, uh, Sanina's work on, on homelessness and the, the er eradication of homelessness, uh, uh, there was the widely um, uh, known principle of housing first, uh, which was then uh, in, in a uh, change laboratories, uh, three interconnected change laboratories was, was uh, uh, re 
uh, examined and and renewed uh, to generate uh, 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 what is called housing first 2.0 uh, uh, to uh, as a, as a basically as a proposal for the government and for uh, the various actors in the field of homelessness uh, uh, to um, to bring their uh, efforts to a new level <clears throat> um, then obviously new theoretical insights into the processes of learning and agency formation that's that's obvious it is after all it is research on learning and agency um, and finally new methodological insights into the ways of designing conducting and anal analyzing formative interventions <clears throat> Uh, this is a very complicated image, and I'm not going to uh, have time to walk you through it, but the idea is that the change laboratory uh, or a similar formative intervention uh, uh, is a key component of a fully fledged, full, full scale methodological repertoire or rep, uh, methodological uh, apparatus uh, for activity theoretical research. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's Obviously, that you know, much of research on act based on activity theory does not use formative interventions, uh, uh, and it uh, it is uh, uh, equally valuable. Uh, however, I think that if we look at carefully at the legacy of uh, cultural historical activity theory uh, and its history, there has always been a, a very central striving for interventions that actually change the world and look for possibilities that go beyond the status quo. Uh, so in that sense, <clears throat> uh, building change laboratories or other formative interventions into the, uh, the methodological apparatus of, of uh, activity theory, to me, is uh, of crucial importance. Now. <clears throat> there are uh, already a good number of methods that have uh, been proven to be useful in the an uh, in analysis of change laboratory data. Uh, I'm listing here uh, uh, six uh, uh, such uh, uh, methods. I don't know what this funny red uh, thing is here on, on the floor. It's certainly not meant to be there. Oh, okay, it disappeared. <clears throat> Um, so these uh, methods here, and, and I'm listing also a number of uh, uh, references uh, where uh, you can find uses of, of these methods, um, are typically based on the on the theoretical ideas behind the formative interventions. They are not just methods like any other method you find in a in a in a textbook. You don't find this in, in textbooks. These are methods that have been developed specifically to serve activity theoretical research and formative interventions. <clears throat> uh, but they are already sufficiently um, tested the, that I'm, uh, uh, I can say that they already uh, are spreading rapidly and, and, and a lot of research is done. Uh, uh, using these methods. Typically, they all more or less rely on very careful documentation of the change laboratory process, which requires that um, these processes are um, uh, preferably videotaped, transcribed, and carefully analyzed. Uh, this is not easy research, I warn you. Uh, a change laboratory, if you have 10 sessions of the two hours each, you can just think how how much um, uh, discourse and and transcript it produces, and to analyze that uh, uh, type of uh, relatively massive discourse uh, pool, uh, systematically implementing uh, some method is is not a piece of cake, but it is doable and it is increasingly done. <clears throat> I think. Uh, uh, if you are, if you have asked, uh, questions about that, I will be happy to go more into details. Um, 
uh, finally, uh, to end this presentation, I would like to emphasize that what we, uh, in my opinion, what we are seeing is a shift, uh, a movement in activity theoretical research toward what I call fourth generation activity theory. Um, <clears throat> The current era, uh, as as we all are painfully aware of, is is that of uh, is it's it's a fateful era uh, for humankind. Uh, we are facing critical global challenges and crises uh, that threaten the very existence of our species on this planet, such as climate change and and extreme poverty, uh, but also very uh, much interconnected crises such as the health crisis, climate change. Uh, poverty, all interconnected. <clears throat> These kinds of objects that you might call faithful objects, uh, uh, like climate change, for instance, they, they cut across and penetrate numerous activity systems, uh, then they can only be tackled uh, by creating uh, uh, coalitions, uh, joining forces. And they call for bold alternatives to capitalism, enacted utopias, as uh, Sanino calls them. <clears throat> so there are some characteristics of fourth generation studies, uh, namely, they invoke heterogeneous multi-activity coalitions uh, that are focused on a critical challenge and aimed at creating viable alternatives to capitalism. They use interconnected formative interventions as the core research design. I mentioned um, the, the recent work of, of Sanino and her research group on, on eradication of homelessness. Homelessness is typically one of those, what some call, call, sometimes called wicked problems, which um, uh, most of the Western countries, at least at the moment, seem completely unable to cope with. Uh, homelessness is, is increasing practically in all uh, Western metropolises uh, and, and uh, uh, fighting homelessness or eradicating homelessness uh, can be really called a, a, a utopia for many people. Uh, however, uh, here in Finland, we have been relatively successful in this effort and, and uh, uh, the work, uh, the recent work of Sanin's research group uh, uh, proved to be quite instrumental in this um, in in this um, a struggle. Um, she conducted three interconnected for uh, change laboratories, one at the level of uh, uh, supported housing unit for formerly homeless youngsters, the other one at the level of a, of a city, and the third one at the level of the entire nation, where the various uh, national actors, including ministries and, and decision makers, came together. <clears throat> so these interconnected formative interventions, multi-level formative interventions, are a, a critical part of what I see as a fourth generation activity theory. Uh, foundations, of course, are still built in local activity systems at the grassroots, but it is necessary to involve also other levels and scales, including those of decision making and policy formation. This also calls for a very persistent longitudinal approach. The studies do not end. There is not a nice uh, point where you say, now it's finished. Uh, uh, struggle against homelessness doesn't end very easily. And there's interplay and cross fertilization of uh, multiple expansive uh, cycles. Uh, and this becomes a very important uh, 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 focus of analysis. Uh, uh, Sanino has described in her homelessness studies, she has described this, uh, this coalescing uh, expansive cycles uh, uh, with this kind of an image. Uh, there is a recent and ongoing work, intervention work in the, in the fourth generation activity theory. I mentioned uh, the Sanino's research program. Uh, uh, there's a, a very important uh, concentration of, of research and intervention work in South Africa, especially at uh, Rhodes University uh, in, a, in a unit led by Heila Lotsi Sitka um, that uh, particularly focuses on climate change and its consequences, overcoming and, and fighting climate change and, and also various issues of of uh, justice uh, uh, in post-apartheid conditions of, of uh, South Africa. Um, 
in Brazil, there are strong groups. Um, um, I, I would like to mention particularly uh, the, the group led by Rodolfo Villela in, in Sao Paulo, uh, especially looking at workers' uh, um, health and, and well being at work in various settings. Um, they have also recently produced a book of a multiple change lab, I think 11 change laboratories uh, conducted in this field. <clears throat> In the United States, I'd like to mention the, the work of Aidan Ball at, in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, recently, she, he has, uh, he has uh, uh, conducted multiple change laboratories, or as he calls them, learning laboratories uh, among uh, 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 indigenous Native American tribes and the, who are um, typically uh, heavily discriminated against in educational systems and, and in the society. Um, and um, I could mention more. I, I think that we, at the moment, we can expect to hear uh, much more about this type of work uh, uh, across the globe. Obviously, it doesn't mean that all activity theoretical research, in my opinion, should be uh, of this kind of uh, fourth generation kind. But I'm saying that uh, if we want to be responsible researchers in this day and age, in this uh, current world, we need to try to move and expand our, uh, our repertoire to include fourth generation activity theoretical studies and formative interventions of this kind. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop with sharing. Just a minute. Yeah, any question, comments? Feel free, you can put in chat or just unmute and uh, ask a question. Can I leap in before anybody else um, does? <clears throat> I was very interested in those pictures you showed of the change laboratory, the four different um, change laboratories, you know, looking back in its history. And they're all um, people sitting around in a meeting room around a table. And I immediately thought of a, a, a practice that's starting to widely spread in Australia used in both education and certain to a certain extent in research, which is yarning circles, which is, comes from our indigenous um, knowledges and ways of working. And I especially once you started to mention um, Aidan Bell and, and some of the ways in which the change laboratory has been used around the world. Have you seen the, an, an ad, adaption of the way change laboratory has been used to really take into account um, indigenous knowledges and ways of working um, in various places? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, Myself, uh, being a, a older white male, middle class uh, Finn, uh, I'm not in the best position to, <laughs> to respond to this. Uh, in Finland, we uh, we have uh, the Sami uh, indigenous people who have been uh, uh, mistreated uh, for centuries. Uh, only now, uh, the Finnish state has finally uh, established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to to to. Uh, to go through this uh, this uh, sad history and and to see what, what might be still possible to do, uh, but um, my, our collaboration uh, involves uh, uh, some uh, very interesting uh, glimpses into this. Uh, there's <clears throat> you mentioned Aidan Ball and his recent work with the with the Native American tribes and. Um, in fact, in, in a couple of his uh, recent papers, one in which uh, both Annalisa Sanino and I are co-authors, published actually 20, 2021 in, um, I'm, I have to pick it up, but uh, um, um, he, the, uh, one of the co-authors is, is, um, is, um, is a leader of, of, the, of the specific Native American tribe that, um, that um, was uh, the, the, where was at this at the uh, you know the focus of, of this study and uh, uh, Aiden has reported that uh, um, when they work in those uh, in those settings uh, there are certain things which immediately 
uh, how a session begins, for instance, uh, the, the, you go through certain rituals to, to, to establish the right kind of spirit uh, among the participants. Uh, I, and I'm not uh, capable of reporting them because I haven't been there myself in these situations, but um, you might uh, look into the more, most recent work of Aidan Ball and his, his colleagues, and I'd be happy to provide. Uh, and of course, you can simply just connect, uh, contact Aidan himself. Uh, um, then in, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, we have been working with uh, uh, Vanessa Thomas uh, in Belo Horizonte, who um, uh, is a, is a university professor um, in mathematics instruction. And she has been leading a, a program for um, indigenous um, teacher education. These are uh, young people who come from uh, indigenous um, uh, communities, uh, various indigenous communities. Uh, they have been sent by their communities to become teachers. And uh, <clears throat> The challenge there has been how to uh, uh, generate a viable teacher education, uh, which this res which respects and builds on on the indigenous knowledge, but at the same time fulfills the academic requirements of of uh, you know teacher credentials and 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 some way of of, of uh, um, actually taking into account the national curriculum. Uh, so this is a very challenging kind of, let's say, merger or, or um, blending. Uh, and we have written an, an article on that, which has not yet been published, in which focused on particularly how, um, when um, the, in this case, the, 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 the sort of conflict was um, uh, culminating in, in the use of money. Because the these youngsters got this government scholarship. This was before Bolsonaro, so uh, uh, when there was still a decent uh, regime in Brazil. But they the, they got the state scholarship, and many for many of them this was the first time they had real money. Uh, and and being in the university in the city for lengthy periods, there was also all the commercial temptations around them, <clears throat> and how this kind of uh, conflicts around money were worked out uh, uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that as, as we respect indigenous knowledges, uh, we also have to be realistic and realize that they don't exist in a vacuum. And there are these continuous uh, interpenetrations and conflicts and tensions between the indigenous uh, ways of knowing and and the dominant capitalist uh, patterns of of uh, activity and and uh, and uh, and um, and thinking. Uh, <clears throat> a third example, I think, uh, that I would strongly recommend is the work of South African colleagues. There is particularly a colleague um, uh, called Botha. Uh, now I forget his first name. Uh, uh, who has written about the change laboratory, uh, the potential of the change laboratory with the indigenous participants. And, uh, and in the group of Hela Lotsi Sitka, there is also a lot of work on this. Uh, I cannot um, really yet say how uh, the work working with indigenous peoples um, actually can reshape and, and transform the change laboratory itself, but I believe it's a it's a very interesting and 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 very real challenge that must be taken. So thank you for the question. Sorry for a very incomplete answer. Thank you. Um, I have a question if no one else does. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, it was very very interesting. Um, it's a, a couple of questions about some of your earlier work and um, whether your thinking has changed. In your 1987 Learning by Expanding, um, you wrote that the primary contradiction of school going was between the exchange and use value of the cultural texts that the students assimilate 
Um, is this still your position? Is the first question. Um, yes. And the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. And that's good. The, the second question, um, what would you say the primary contradiction of school teaching would be? Is it the same thing? Um, is, is cultural text the object of teaching activity? Um, or is it some type of student text hybrid? Or anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think this is a very good question because obviously <clears throat> school uh, learning or school going and school teaching are not one of the same activity. They are two different activities. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, it is a little bit like <laughs> I used to do some work in prisons and, and uh, uh, you know, the prison guards, uh, they may be longer time in prison than any of their inmates, but uh, but there's it's still a different activity, <laughs> guarding uh, prisoners and being a prisoner. So uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, no no uh, no pun intended about the school. Uh, uh, I'm not claiming that it's a prison, although uh, in my in my childhood there were moments, <laughs> but uh, uh, the um, Primary contradiction for teaching, for teaching activity. Well, first of all, it's wage labor. Uh, and as wage labor, obviously, you know, the issue is, uh, again, uh, you know, if you start from the issue that you're, uh, you're, you're producing com commodities, but you're also producing, uh, uh, they, they, they carry some use value. Uh, so I think that from the point of view of, of a teacher, the challenge is, Quite there, 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 it has similarities in the sense, especially when teachers are pressured to do constant um, uh, pressured uh, testing and 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 uh, grading. Um, testing when testing and grading take the upper hand of teaching, which is oftentimes the case in the United States, for instance, today. Um, you know that uh, in a way it becomes. Uh, teaching for tests, teaching for grades, and, and not for the use value of knowing and understanding the world. <clears throat> and uh, this has caused in the US uh, um, a rel relatively massive uh, uh, movement of teachers leaving their profession, leaving actually the teaching profession at the moment, uh, be, uh, feeling that uh, they, they, they have lost the uh, uh, autonomy and, and, the, and the possibility to actually do meaningful use value oriented work. Uh, so this, I think, exemplifies what is the, the primary contradiction for teaching. Uh, um, but where the, the sort of use value aspect lies is obviously somehow in the combination of uh, knowing the, the world uh, as a source of knowledge and the student as a potentially eager learner. Uh, uh, that's a wonderful, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say coming together when it happens that you see that actually students uh, uh, get enthusiastic about learning something. And that's, uh, that's why people become teachers, I suppose. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> because they, they, there is that use value and it, you can never fully eliminate it, no matter, no matter how uh, strictly you want to tailorize and, and, and streamline uh, teaching. You can never fully er eradicate the use value aspect of, of teaching. Uh, but uh, I, I have to admit that I haven't studied teachers sufficiently to, to, to grab the, you know, how this is turned into in the, their current, current teaching work, how this is turned into uh, those critical uh, conflicts or motives that, that teachers um, experience. But I think that oftentimes, in many cultures, at least, these conflicts or motives have to do with uh, grading and testing. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, this is pretty much part of my PhD studies. Um, so as, as I, um, it's a terrible phrase, but I see a gap in the literature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I think you're quite right. And I'd be very, very interested to 
to hear how your work pro uh, progresses. So, uh, thank uh, you. I'd, I'd be happy to learn more about it. Thank you. It was really interesting. Any other question? Brendan? Yes, uh, quick question. I've just been rereading an article that was an interview that you did in, in 2012 in Europe's Journal of Psychology on third generation activity theory, seeing as you're now talking about fourth and you just mentioned teachers and students. So on, on the second page, you, you talked about a teacher and a student both comprising separate activity systems. And it's the interaction between the two that forms the, the criterial interest for you. So assuming that you still hold that view, I'm wondering what the role of community is then if every individual could potentially be a separate activity system. Oh, okay. I wouldn't call an individual an activity system. I think that the individuals are members or participants in, a, in multiple activity systems. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, your point about the community and, and uh, third and fourth generation here, uh, the reason why I took that example in that interview was that I think it was very clear that <clears throat> there had been a tendency to somehow um, melt together teaching and learning too much, uh, not to understand that there are two different activities and their interplay and, and um, tensions between them must be understood, uh, especially you know when, when uh, cognitive science became very very prominent in, in educational research. Uh, often people stop talking about teaching and only wanted to talk about learning. In a way, so, so that it, it, uh, teaching was kind of pushed out of the picture. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I thought that the, the third generation uh, activity theory is in a good position to remind us to take the, both of these activities seriously and to look at their interplay. Um, now, if I look at it, this situation from the fourth generation point of view, I would say, look at what are the other activities with which a school may create coalitions? Because schools alone cannot change the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if they uh, find coalitions and join forces with, let's say, um, local communities, local social movements, uh, etc., they may actually achieve a lot more. Uh, so this, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm conducting a, a major study of, of eighth graders here in Finland who are um, uh, asked to actually conduct projects of their own, own choice and, and to find uh, partners um, also outside the school. And it's very interesting how uh, um, little we know about this potentials of, of part, uh, partnering with, with various actors in the society, how uh, it is still a sort of an under, um, understudied uh, field. Uh, partnerships typically are uh, still understood mainly as, uh, you know, uh, parent participation in school matters. Um, but uh, what about, you know, uh, 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 other forces? I think that we can, we have a lot, uh, lot to learn from, um, again, from the global south. For instance, there is a recent wonderful book by Rebecca Tarlow on, on uh, how the Brazilian um, um, MST, which is the um, uh, landless workers uh, movement, uh, uh, which is one of the largest social movements in the world and also one of the most durable ones, uh, which has uh, basically uh, led to uh, massive um, occupation of, of land, which has not been productively in use, but owned by, by, by corporate or private owners uh, and, and uh, turned it into productive use for, uh, for those who uh, were without any land. But what is important is that uh, this movement also started immediately building schools and creating schools that, uh, that serve those, uh, those uh, newly emerging communities. And they have actually had uh, 
quite an impact on the overall educational policy of the country. Uh, because um, uh, in a way, they presented a model of schooling, which was totally grounded on the community needs rather than on a sort of a centralized educational policy or, or standard curriculum. And uh, uh, this type of um, examples, I think, uh, are important for us to learn from. Uh, <clears throat> so while the third generation idea of two activity systems interacting around a partially shared object, I think it's perfectly valid. But right now, uh, uh, we I would hope that we can also open our eyes to other possible activity systems and coalitions that make, um, for instance, schools more powerful than they have been. Thank you. There's a wonderful book from 1932 from George S. Counts, which was called, it's a little book, it's called Dare the School Build a New Social Order. Uh, and of course, the, I would say, uh, not alone. <laughs> can I can I ask? Um, you talk. You began the session um, talking about random controlled experiments as the gold standard, mm. and that those those experiments or those studies are informing policy, and particularly that is the case for education for evidence based practice. So I'm just wondering with the fact that you're currently um, engaged in a, a, a big study in the year eight, how would you go about working with governments in, in the, whatever happens as a result of these studies? So that it can just change from, and I'm not sure what the situation is in Finland, but here it's, it's a constant, in, in Australia that is, there's that mm -hmm. constant aspect of working against, from a school perspective and from an educator's perspective, working um, up against governments, up against think tanks, um, as far as other, other actors driving the policy that we as educators are implementing in schools. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, first of all, perhaps I'm in a, in a fortunate position that uh, Finland is such a small country. <laughs> that, that, uh, it's a bit uh, perhaps less uh, overwhelmingly um, uh, oppressive, the, the state apparatus. Uh, you, you can see through it a little bit more easily perhaps. Mm -hmm. And this means that, because every machinery has cracks. Uh, uh, and so to find those cracks, so where you can in, in fact, uh, uh, find a way to initiate meaningful dialogue and perhaps influence the decision making is, is I think, increasingly important. But those cracks, uh, it's, it's, in a way, we, uh, I would say that for me, the fourth generation, part of the, the idea of the fourth generation activity theory is that we, ha we have to pay attention to those cracks in, 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 in power. In, 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 we have to study more up as uh, there, there was a, there is a wonderful anthropologist uh, 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 who, who wrote about studying up, meaning that we have to look at what happens in corporate boardrooms and, and, uh, and governments, etc. cetera. And um, uh, we just can't leave them alone anymore. <laughs> so, but, and finding those cracks, uh, 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 in other words, it may be individuals, it may be some statements uh, in the government program that are contradictory and open up a possibility, etc. Oftentimes, I think that the sort of middle level civil servants, um, uh, uh, among them, you find a, a surprising number of reasonable people <laughs> whose, whose voices are seldom heard. But if they have a chance to en enter dialogue, uh, something may actually happen. Uh, so uh, that's why I think uh, looking at these different levels, municipal level, regional level, uh, na national level, and, and moving across them. But at the same time, you know, 
it's important that you recruit, for instance, various NGOs, uh, various social movements that uh, that you can work with, because if you're alone as a researcher, or even alone as a single school or uh, or, or a number of school teachers, it is much less um, impactful than if 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 the if the decision makers start start seeing that here is actually emerging some sort of a coalition. Um, uh, This is not a good answer, and because uh, I don't know enough the Australian conditions, but um, my my memory of my years in the United States, uh, uh, they were not very encouraging. <laughs> but then now that I read uh, more about um, um, what teachers are doing, for instance, in the U.S., uh, it is perhaps a little bit different picture. Um, the uh, if if uh, such um, movements like, the, for instance, at the moment, this movement of, of openly saying that we cannot teach in these conditions anymore, uh, gain momentum, uh, they, they will have impact. Thank you. So any other questions? I noticed that Meg has written in the in the chat that yeah. there are cracks in the in our Australian government. <laughs> I would say that there are also crack pots in almost any government. So, <laughs> so that the cracks can be understood in many ways. But just to to add what to what um, Rio said about working with the Finnish government, we've at Deakin we work very closely with the. I mean, in Australia, um, education is a state matter. So. Victoria is actually a smaller country than um, than Finland, mm -hmm. um, but we've been able to establish very good relations with, as you say, um, you know, middle level bureaucrats within the education department, and have a continuing series of projects which are really aimed at, at making a difference in the way. Certainly, in, in our group, science education, science and uh, STEM education is is being undertaken. So there there are, as you say, cracks where we can, if we work at establishing relationships, um, get really good things happening. And I think it's, it's you know, we, we need to resist the council despair and, and really continue working yeah. in that way. It's very important. Thanks, Meg. I, I think more should be written about these kinds of, of you know, uh, and Rebecca Tarlow's book, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you the, the uh, it is called, Occupying land, occupying schools. Uh, it, what is interesting about it is that she discusses at length the issue of uh, 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 remaining autonomous versus being co-opted. You know, when 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 do you uh, if if you engage in this kind of collaboration and dialogue with with uh, let's say governments, uh, what, when when do you lose your autonomy? When you do, when do you lose your identity and become co-opted in the in the in the system uh, uh, I think it's a very important discussion but it requires very concrete cases to examine uh, so that we can build on on each other's experiences uh, the fact is that governments probably are easier to deal with than let's say uh, um, Google or Facebook or uh, or uh, the the technology giants, because at least governments have, in principle, uh, uh, accountability to people, uh, whereas these uh, uh, technology giants who also have a tremendous impact uh, on on learning and and uh, and uh, education um, have very little accountability. Thank you, Mac, for sharing the link. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I say a few words? May I? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Good morning uh, or your good afternoon, great Australian organizers. It was a great chance that we waked up very early today to hear Orio. And it was another great chance that the great scholars of this community, ISCAR community, come by, their, by themselves to speak and interact with the PhD students. This is only in ISCAR community that is happened. Thank you, Orio. Thank you that you offer yourself to the PhD students so simply. Thank you, Katerina, <laughs> very, for your very kind words. Um, there, are, there are issues here in the, in the chat, uh, which uh, I think that we're running out of time, but uh, uh, very briefly, there is this last question. If there is a book or article uh, that would uh, uh, help us um, uh, understand uh, how to identify primary contradictions in each constituent component of the, of the triangle, um, and I'm just writing that at the moment, I don't know of any such um, analysis. In fact, I think it would be badly needed. Maybe, um, maybe you will write it. And if you write it, uh, uh, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I think uh, uh, th that's a very, very relevant and, and real need. Uh, uh, MP, who is MP? Mikhail. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I think that it is a, it's a, it's badly needed, and um, you know you because in the in that way you you come to the very core of of the uh, commoditization and and uh, the and the and the um, uh, basically. Uh, the primary contradictions make make you, um, in a way, also easily a little bit uneasy, <laughs> because they are they don't go away. They don't. They, you can't just uh, eliminate them. Uh, you, you can't eliminate from our lives the fact that we uh, our lives are uh, commodified. Uh, and that uh, that uh, each one of us is both uh, both exchange value and, and use value. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, but they can be trans transcended and transformed. They cannot be eliminated. Uh, uh, so, um, what what this uh, uh, entry in the chat uh, for Michael actually um, um, makes me think about is that um, we should we should uh, perhaps uh, write about with contradictions uh, uh, without become desperate <laughs> in this day and age how to keep optimistic and uh, and uh, uh, energized by contradictions rather than let them uh, drag you down <laughs>